Good morning, good morning, good morning. God bless you all. God bless you all. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you this morning. To God be the glory for another day that the Lord has allowed us to see. God bless you all. We thank you for joining us this morning. We are so, so excited. Uh, another lesson that we're going to share on today. We're going to thank God for you, you and you for joining us. We're going to thank God for Pastor Smith and Pastor Moody being with us this morning. Mother Pat, Deacon Gell, uh, Brother Josh, Sister Tina, uh, Sister Rita Cooper, uh, Cousin Pam, Sister Beatrice, Latifa, uh, Sister Yolanda. Thank God for seeing each and every one of you guys. Again, we thank you for being a part of this. This has been a wonderful wonderful experience. I'm so excited uh, about what God is doing. We thank God for our brother John and, uh, and, and all those who are joining us on Instagram. Amen. Good morning to you guys each. You know, it's so good to see you guys. Just greet each other. Like I said, we got to keep this thing as normal as possible. Amen. Our virtual hugs, our virtual kisses as well. I pray that everyone is doing well and everyone is safe and everyone's good and you stand encouraged. Amen. As we continue to trust God through this process, um, for whatever is going to become of this, you know, things are starting to evolve. Things are starting to move. My prayer is that you continue to pray, uh, use wisdom, pray, have faith and use wisdom and how you move and how you do. Do not get restless. Amen. Do not get restless that we do things suddenly uh, because we are bored and things of that nature. And we bring this because God is just an awesome God and he has allowed us to share this. And this has become a great platform of conversation. Um, I know some of even people are still working. They either watch this before they go to work. And even uh, I got a call yesterday, want us to come in and do a couple of hours during the week just to come in. Um, but I told them I could only do certain hours because of the fact that I'm going to continue this uh, until God says something different. Because this has been a, truly a blessing um, to, to be doing this and to share. Um, and as the more I do it, the more I get excited. I, I found a, a new refreshing in the word and I, I listened to uh, Pastor Moody's uh, uh, live yesterday, and he said one of the things that God has done in this is forced us to get that rest that we kept saying we needed. And he has forced us to get that rest. And one of the things about this is that we cannot use the excuse, I do not have time. I do not have time to do this. I do not have time to do that. So whatever it is that was been in your heart that you should have been doing, I've been talking to people about doing your books, doing your lesson plans, creating new curriculum. Think outside the box. Don't look to go back just in the same way. Um, Sister Gail, you're on here. I want you to really get comfortable. I want you to get comfortable. And I'm telling all of you, get comfortable doing this because this is not something, I, I do enjoy this because I get to interact, but it's not something I would say that I would jump to do it, but I understand the purpose of this and we have to lean into what God is saying. So even when it comes to uh, how you did what you did, start thinking about how I could do this different. If I need to do online class, I have a friend of mine right now who I'm working with. We're actually partnering with this. And I'm going to get into the lesson. We're going to have our prayer. And we're partnering with, because he's taught his kids uh, homeschooling. And if you're not ready to embrace homeschooling, you're going to be in for a surprise. Because homeschooling is going to really, really be here to stay. I, I foresee going back to school, uh, Deacon Gale, that it's probably going to be part-time. Uh, not only part-time, in the classroom part of the day. That's the way I see it because in order to accommodate, we're already overcrowded. So now they're probably looking at half the capacity for half a day, then the other half in another part, there's going to be at home schooling. Or if it's not in your home, there's going to become some type of setting. So we have to prepare ourselves for what God is speaking in this season. Online workouts. I don't know if Sister Song is on here, but online workouts, things of that nature, online teaching, um, cooking classes. You have to be creative in the things you do. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for this day, this wonderful day that you have allowed us to see. We're glad to be found in the land of the living. And Father, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who has made the ultimate sacrifice of giving his life for us. And Father, as we come today, we ask that you be in the midst, that you touch the hearts and mind of every individual that's under the sound of my voice that decided to watch this broadcast, to tune in, to say, what must I do to be saved? Who's looking for strength, that's looking for encouragement, who's looking for insight and more information about who you are as their Lord and Savior. And we thank you for each and every one of them in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say amen, amen, amen. Again, let's use our virtual, our virtual track, our digital track, and by sharing this, starting the watch party, Get this out as many people as possible that they can receive the word of God. Um, I believe with Sister Smith. Hey, Sister Beverly Lugo, how are you? God bless you. How's everything? Um, Sister Smith, Pastor Smith said yesterday about, she. I think she shared the lesson 
And she said, you need to understand it's about sin. And, and, and the purpose of this is so important. And I don't know if uh, uh, Evangelist Elder Carmelita Chestnut is on. And just to show you guys, these lessons, I have gone back into the archive. I have in my library here at the house, uh, my old Sunday school books, because I taught Sunday school. I was the uh, superintendent of Sunday school for many, many years. And this is where I got my foundation. And it's where um, I learned what I know today. I mean, honestly, what I know today through my uh, pastors and through the teachings, but a lot of it came through um, coming through Sunday school, which every week, because I would teach, because I was over it, I was, I must say, forced to have a study habit, good study habit. So that's kind of helped me over the years uh, to kind of understand the Bible and to learn the Bible. You don't realize how much you know sometimes until you go back and you start sharing these lessons. And this particular series that I was looking into, I look back and I don't know if you can see this, but it says 1993 to 94. It goes back that far, uh, many, 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 many years ago. But as even go back 2000 years ago, the word of God is still relevant, is very, very much relevant for today, amen? So again, I pray that yesterday's lesson was a blessing to you. Uh, you took good notes because remember on Thursday, and I'm telling you honestly, I forget what day it is. I forgot it was Wednesday today. Amen. But on Thursday, we will have our quiz. And it's not about uh, failure or passing, but it's a, it's a have fun. And it makes us get more involved because I remember when we first started doing it, somebody said, you mean to tell me I have to actually get out of my bed and get a pen? Yeah, because I know for some of you guys, you don't even get out of bed yet, amen. That, and that's all good, but that's the beauty of this, that you're able to roll over and get this lesson, amen, and just be relaxed. Grab, grab your cup of coffee. I have mine right here, amen, uh, getting started. Some, some, some regular coffee with some oat milk and some some sea moss in it, amen. That's just how I roll and how I do what I do, amen. But to God be the glory. And I want to thank each and every one of you also for birthday wishes on yesterday. It was a blessing. It was wonderful. We had part of the leadership team come by. They did a little drive-by parade. It was it was good. I had a quarantine party with my family. And it was funny because at one point, everybody was standing around with masks on. I was like, this is funny. But it was really, really good. And, um, and we didn't even have a candle. We didn't have a candle. We used a chopstick. Well, they took a chopstick and lit it as a, you know, a candle, but that, but it's all about family, it's all about love, and that was a blessing in itself. Good morning, Mother Tisdale. So good to see you. So today, today, we talked about the judgment of sin on yesterday. We talked about the judgment of sin, and this, I, I believe this lesson today is going to be very, very uh, interesting for a lot of you, and it may cause you to dive a little bit further in your study. And even as we talk about sin and we talk about these things, sometimes these are uncomfortable conversations, but they shouldn't be. I think us for us to understand what certain things are uh, is very important in, in the house of God. Amen. Uh, I've asked a question a few months ago, a few months ago, and and the question was, and I got no response. I'm gonna let you know right now, I got no response. I my question was, what do you consider not to be sin? What do you consider not to be sin? Amen. Because I must say, there's some things that people don't think are sins. They don't think they're things that. God frowned upon. And, and one, I'm going to tell you what, what the definition of sin that I use. And if you look it up and it actually means this, sin simply means to miss the mark. Sin means to miss the mark, which means basically I am aiming for a target. I'm aiming for something. I'm trying. I'm attempting. I'm striving. I'm striving. I'm making the effort through faith, because that's what it is, to hit the target. Every now and then, I may miss the target. Amen? Amen. It's not, I'm not going to say it's good or bad. It's neither, neither or. It's the fact that you're, you're operating in that way, that you're aiming for the target. My only problem is when you're not aiming for the target at all. If you're not aiming for the target, you stand absolutely no chance of, of hitting the target. Amen? So God takes grace and allows you to hit that target. So we talk about things like sin. It's forced to come up out of certain things because sin is definitely, it's, it's killing you. It's, it's killing all of us. Whenever we allow sin to to reside or sin to have a stronghold on us or have a grip on us because temptation is going to come. We talked about temptation and all that stuff and how it presents itself about tasting and not drinking, tasting and not drinking. Amen. Um, if things are going to come to your mind, thoughts are going to come to your mind, considerations are going to come to your mind, but we want to have the strength to say no to those things. We want to have the strength to say no. no. And when you recognize that I don't have the strength, God help me in that area. Or you think that I'm good. You think that I'm good because we've been there. Let me let me help you understand something. I'm not impressed by your title. I don't care if you're pastor, apostle, bishop, whoever you are. You are not exempt from temptation. If Jesus was tempted after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, 
Who are you? Temptation is going to come. But the Bible let us know that with every temptation, God will provide a way of escape. Amen. It's what happens in that moment of a moment of temptation. And, and understand this, that the enemy is very conniving. We talked about him being very subtle. We talked about how he deceived Eve. And that's what he does. He comes to deceive you. He comes to trick you, um, to move you out. Because initially you may not disobey. You may not fall into sin. You may not, but he has started to deceive you. And he's very, very subtle. Amen. So today, today we want to talk about redemption. We want to talk about redemption because once sin came into place, once Adam fell and that Adamic nature became part of our DNA and who we are, because the Bible tells us that we are all born in sin and we are shaped in iniquity. And the word iniquity means hidden sins. See, there's some sins that become obvious to other people's eyes. And, and what I never want to take for granted, is, and honestly, because I don't know who our listening audience is, and I've talked to pastors about this, and those pastors that are on board, Please take this in consideration. If we're going to broadcast and we're going to have an audience that we can't even measure, because we can't measure this audience that we have, we don't know who's tuning in. We don't know their church experience. We must use a language, and this is something I teach to my um, church all the time, <clears throat> not just the outreach, <clears throat> because everybody's outreach. Speak English to people. Speak English. If you speak Spanish, speak Spanish. We cannot talk in a King James language. We cannot talk in church lingo because people don't understand it. Keep it simple and don't assume that people understand certain things. And you, even some of you who have been saved for years, there's some things that we kind of skipped over. And, and I'm going to tell you why. And I, I, and I teach this to pastors all the time because one of my main audience, I love teaching pastors and leaders. I love that. I love teaching all people, but especially pastors and leaders um, because I'm, I'm the original, and it's going to sound funny, uh, uh, Olivia Pope. I, I am the fixer. She is not the fixer. I am the fixer. This is what God has given me as a gift. I do it on every job I go to. I go to a different place. I come in. I assess the situation. I say, we can make this better. I, I, I deal with a lot of logistics. I try to say, we can flow this better. We can make this make more sense or this become more productive. So a lot of things, when we joined the church and became a part of a ministry, we just became part of the fabric. We just kind of did what we call parakeeting. And what parakeeting is, what you say, I say. What they say, I say. And it becomes the lingo because I want to be accepted. So I speak the language that's in the land that I'm in. But I don't always understand what it is that I'm saying. So what I like to do is take the word and break the word down. That's why Sunday school is so, so important. And that's why you have to teach. That's why teaching is so, so important. And I thank God for the gift that he's given me to do that. Because what the way I approach teaching, and I share this on one of our broadcasts, is when God first laid on my heart about teaching Sunday school, I was only saved a couple of months. And I don't even think I was truly saved. I think I was saved. I was in church. I just started coming, um, Pastor Moody. And, and, and as I was studying, the Lord says, and it was one of these books. It had to be one of these books. And the Lord said, don't study to learn, but study to teach. And my whole approach to how I study the word, how I prepare myself, is from the perspective of the student. I ask in my, within myself the questions that people ask when I come across a certain passage of scripture. I'll pause as the Holy Spirit will give me guidance and say, okay, bring this point out a little bit more or explain this without a person asking a question. So even though a person still asks a question, I want to answer the question in my teaching. I don't want to just give you information, but I want you to understand what that information means. So we talk about words like sin. We think sin, 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 but you have what's called iniquity. And those are the hidden sins of the heart. And those are things like pride. Now, pride will manifest itself on the outside by the way you carry yourself and your behavior, jealousy, envy, hatred. Hatred is not always visible. Even though there may be acts of hatred that takes place, many times it resides in your heart for a long time, amen, before it even comes out. And what it's doing is destroying us. We talked about bitterness on Sunday. Bitterness always disguises itself and covers itself, amen? So, so today we're going to talk about redemption because we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glo glory of God. And when we're talking about the Old Testament, a lot of times we don't like to read the Old Testament. We don't understand the story. We know the stories, but we don't understand the purpose behind the stories. And today, what I'm going to share with you, it's going to be about redemption because what the word redemption means, means to redeem. It simply means to buy back. That means something that I had once had was now no longer in my possession. Amen. So when man fell, they were no longer in God's possession because of sin. They have fallen into the world. They have given into the sinful nature. So now God had come up with a plan 
Now, let me tell you something what the Bible is about. The Bible itself, overall, if you look at the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, the way it's broken down, there's certain books of prophecy, there's books of the law, there's books of songs, there's books of letters to the church. There's a lot of things that's broken down into parts when you really break down the Bible. Amen? You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament, right? But the book of the Bible, and you have history. If you look at the book of Acts, those are books of history. There's certain books in the Old Testament that are historical books. They're dealing with the Bible from a historical perspective. Some deal it from uh, um, letters, letters, laws, laws of the Bible. But the, the overall picture of the Bible, the overall picture of the Bible, because some people say, this seems inconsistent. This don't seem to line up. Why is it open? It's about redemption. The whole Bible is about redemption, redeeming, buying man back to God. That's the whole purpose. You don't understand anything, understand that the entire Bible is about the redemption process. So you, when you look at redemption, when you, when you look at redemption and you look now, now that's gonna change your lens, how you look at the, the Bible. You're just not gonna pick and choose little parts and say, okay, I memorized that part, but I don't know how to apply it. So today I'm gonna share something which was called, uh, uh, things are called types, and shadows. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They're called types and shadows. Where did I do? Oh, here's over here. With uh, Types and shadows. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of definition about what some of these are. Amen? So types and shadows. The Bible, the Old Testament, because what I want you to do, I want you to understand that the Old Testament was preparing you for the New Testament. And I know in parts, we see little parts there. And I think on Sunday when I talked about it, it talked about uh, the prophecy from Isaiah, and we know there's certain prophecy, but the entire Old Testament was really about foreshadow. It was about what was to come. So when you talk about a type, we type, talk about type, I wrote down the definition. A type is a person or event or ceremony that is the foreshadow of something to come. A type is a person, an event, or ceremony that is the foreshadow of something to come. A shadow and a type could sometimes be interchangeable, but a type, when you look at it, it represents something else. It's symbolic of something else to come. When you talk about a shadow, if you're walking down the street and someone sees your shadow, your shadow is not you. It's a presentation of you. It's not the absolute you, but it's a presentation of you, and that shadow has to be attached to something or someone. Amen, or some type of ceremony. So in the Old Testament, there are a lot of types. There are a lot of shadows. There are a lot of things that are symbolic of things to come. So when we talk about redemption, we know the ultimate redemption is Christ dying on the cross for us. That's the ultimate redemption because he brought us back. How did he buy us back? How did he buy us back? With his blood. We talked about it yesterday because in the Old Testament, when Adam fell, the first thing they tried to do was cover themselves with a fig leaf. And sometimes we have a fig leaf salvation. We try to cover ourselves through our own acts. We think that we could do things to redeem ourselves back. You can't buy your soul back from the devil. The devil is not interested in anything you have to offer. The devil is like, <laughs> what do they call them? I think it's same day loans or uh, uh, payday loans and things like that. They're like, he's like a loan shark. The devil is like a loan shark. No matter what. You borrow from him. You can never pay him back because he never plays by the rules. So when you think you're getting over, when you think you're getting by by finding shortcuts and doing things to get over, they're trying to circumvent certain things, and you go to the enemy to help you out, and the enemy has a lot of imps. He has a lot of people that work for him. He uses a lot of people. And again, we talked about the book of James, how he would take your own lust and draw you out. That's how you get them same day or whatever you call them, them loans that you get where the interest rate is ridiculous. You know how you go to the car dealership and you know your credit is, you know, really not impressive. Your credit is not impressive at all. You go there and they tell you, we guarantee you now. They said, we guarantee you anybody can get a car loan. And they do. And I'm telling you, even now, be careful. Even now, they're going to be offering deals, but be careful. You're going to sit in there. And, and they're going to run your credit and that paper going to keep running. It's going to keep running. You're going to realize, uh-oh, I got a lot of problems. Now, what they're going to do, they may not send you home, but they're going to send you to this other office down the hallway. And it's called special finance. And special finance is like 25 to 28 percent. Trust me. The reason I know this because I have experienced this for myself. So I'm sharing with you what I know. But that is the devil. That is the devil because you're paying, you're paying triple for a car that ain't even worth what you're paying for. So that's what the enemy does. He tried to get you to buy back certain things in your own effort, in your own strength. 
but God has given us the ultimate sacrifice of redemption to buy back. So we talk about these types and shadows and we, we talk about it throughout the Bible. There were many things that was in the Bible that was symbolic of these things, amen? Because th there was a need for redemption because of the fall of man, amen? First one was Adam represented the first the first Adam. The, Adam was the first Adam and Jesus became the second Adam. It was being born again. The first one was Adam and that's where we came from. So you have these types, you have these shadows. Uh, uh, the type is only a shadow and then it's called, uh, redemption was a, a type in a variety of ways in the Old Testament and talk about how it blessed us today. And blood was always blood. Why was blood necessary? Why was blood always necessary? I'm going to let you think about that. What do we find in blood? What do blood, what is blood symbolic of? I'm going to see if anybody typed that up there right, right quick. Anybody, anybody, anybody know what, what blood is symbol, symbolizes? Amen. I don't see any, any, any typing. No, no, no. Amen. No. Blood symbolizes life. There's life in the blood. There's life in the blood. Amen. So blood always symbolized life. That's why when there was a sacrifice of the Old Testament and God used these temporary, these temporary because he was showing you different types. When you go back to the types of, of sacrifices you had to offer for certain things. And that's a whole nother lesson. And we're going to need about two, three, four, five hours to go over that. But what I'm doing, I want to prompt you to study. I want you to start digging in. I, I, I have a, a whole lot of books in my library and I'm going to tell you something. My blessing besides Sunday school used to be, I would get up and some of you that's local will understand what I'm talking about, Hawthorne Gospel, because we as African-Americans didn't have a lot of resources for certain things. Amen. There wasn't a lot of bookstores. I think it was a bookstore on the 24th and 10th at one time. But Hawthorne Bible, I used to go out there to their library and I would sit there with books all over the table and study. That was when I was studying. Now I study, but I don't, I'm studying more now. I mean, even more now. I'm digging a little bit deeper than I used to because now God has taken me back to go back to that old landmark. They say, this is the way that I want you to do. But we got to get into studying more and getting taking the time for God. Amen. I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said, one of the key words, we got a lot of new words, not new words, words are being used. One of the words is essential. I, one of the questions I want to ask you, what is going to be essential to you when you come out of this? When it's this quarantine, this whole thing kind of lift and things start to get, show some symbolism of normalcy, what are some of the essential things you realize that you need in life or I did not need in life? One of the essential things I need is my time to sit down and really, really, really dedicate myself to study in a whole different way. Some say, you study, Pat. Yeah, I do. But I realize I have to dig in even more because this right here, this is life. There's life in the word of God. Amen. It is life just like it's in the blood. So when you look back over the different symbols, right? Amen. We look at uh, the Passover land. We look at uh, Abel uh, giving a sacrifice to God because remember Cain gave one of the earth. And, and one gave one of the field. But when we look at we look at the Lamb of God, when we talk about the Lamb of God, you're constantly seeing in the Old Testament a lamb that was given up. But one of the key things about that lamb, and even for the Passover, we talk about the feasts and the festivals that they had to hold. One of the things about the, that lamb would have had to be without blemish and without bruise. Without blemish and without bruise. Think about it. Who did that represent? That was a foreshadowing of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So then you had what's called uh, these different feasts. One of the feasts was known as the Passover feast. And the Passover feast was where every man would select a household lamb without spot or blemish. And then they had a process. Now, here's the thing. With their feast and their sacrifice, let me tell you something. There was a process. It was work. It was work. And the, the thing about it, as we get later to the tabernacle, because when I first started finding out about shadows and types, it came when I studied the tabernacle. And I taught this at my church a few years back, and I'm going to bring it back eventually because I try to cycle through because I realize everybody don't, didn't have these lessons. But even in the tabernacle, when they had to bring their sacrifices to the priests, right? They would come once a year. They had to line up to bring these sacrifices. And each type of sacrifice represent a type of sin that you had. Now, we barely want to repent today. We barely want to repent. Some of us would not have survived the Old Testament. 
That's why God knew that he needed us in such a time as this, because we would not have made it in the Old Testament. We barely come to church. We barely come to Bible study. We don't come to prayer. So how do we be able to give these sacrifices? But it wasn't any type. And you got to remember, even Israel, Israel itself, God's chosen people was symbolic of the church today. These were the select people. God chose this tribe out of Jacob to be his, his, uh, the tribe of Israel, that they could be in a reflection in the earth realm to other people about this God that they serve. That's why if you look, if you really, really, really look, Israel wasn't that strong. They weren't the greatest. Only time Israel got in, in, in trouble was when they were disobedient to God. That's when God took back his hand. And let me tell you something. I thank God for grace because see, they didn't have grace. They had mercy. But God will allow them to realize, you know, without me, this is what's going to happen. You don't have the strength. And I pray to God that we understand that today, that when, when, when we step out from under grace, that the enemy, we, we're open territory for the enemy. The enemy's coming for us. So you have Israel who represented. So the things and the traditions that they had to do, they had the feast of the unleavened bread. Let me talk about the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread means there was no yeast in it. There was no yeast in it. Uh, I remember when we were at the synagogue here in Patterson when I was a highway church and we would have our service there because we was renting it out with the purpose to buy it. But let me tell you something, even though we had not bought it yet and we were renting, paying a significant amount of rent there, there were certain things as Jews, they wouldn't even let us do there. On Sundays, um, I think we, they were selling donuts, but you could have dairy because this is part of the Old Testament. And understand, the Jews believe in the Old Testament. They still keep these laws. These are what's known as laws. These are known as tradition. These are things they did because they were waiting for the Messiah. And all these things were, was, was significant and symbolism and types that was pointing toward that unleavened bread with the yeast that would cause the bread to rise. And what happens with us, when we get yeast, which is for us, is really our flesh, we rise up and we get full of ourselves. We get full of, say they was required to have unleavened bread, which was a metaphor for sin and their old life in Egypt. Even Egypt. Egypt represent your time in slavery, your time in captivity. Because remember, after Joseph was there and after many, many years, they say they forgot about Joseph God and all that Joseph God. Y'all need to go back and read your Bibles. I'm telling you, go back and read your Bibles. Because when now they found themselves in captivity, Amen. And then we remember the story. Moses came along as what? A deliverer. Symbolic of who? Amen. So throughout, and I'm telling you there's tons. I'm talking about look up the words types and shadows. That's part of your homework assignment. Look up the word types and shadows in the Bible and they will list all the types and all the shadows that's in the Old Testament that's pointing to Jesus. So let me tell you something. Jesus didn't just pop up a few years ago. He ain't new on the scene. He ain't something God said, you know what? I think I, I'm going to try something else. No, from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And part of the Old Testament, part of the Old Testament was to show us that these temporary fixes is not going to fix you. Because remember, all of these symbols, all of these things that they did was on the external. These was through their own effort. See, today we're under grace. We love grace, but let me tell you the requirement for grace, faith. Faith is the only thing that God requires of you. It's the only thing that God requires of you. And it's the hardest thing for us. Forgiveness, takes faith. Let go of bitterness, take faith. To open up that business, take faith. Because I'm trusting God. It's not, I'm not going to do it just based on my financials. I'm not going to just do it based on my credit. But I'm trusting and I'm believing God. And because I'm trusting and believing God, i got to have faith. I'm doing this out of faith. I started doing this out of faith. I was like, do what? Get up 7 o'clock and do what? Okay, you say do it. I'm going to do it. Amen. So it takes faith and you see the blessing. You see the blessing. And people will say, What's the secret to your success? My faith in God. That's simply what it is. It's not school and education plays a role. All that plays a role. It's, it's going out and learning. But all of that is going to take faith to do it. Amen? Amen. So we, we continue to look at that. We look at the feast of the first fruit. Where they had to go out to the field and take the sheave. And they would come and wave it. Because when we talk about first fruit offering, you give God what's his first off the top. Even when it comes to giving, amen, you don't sit down and I, listen, I don't know who church I belong, but I'm telling you what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. You give your God your first fruit. You give him your best. You don't cut God some off the bottom, off the middle. You don't even put God in your budget, amen? You take that 10%, you set it aside. You don't say, okay, I'm going to do my budget. 
And if I got 10% left over, if I got an offering, no, you bring an offering to the Lord. You give God your best. He, God give, gave you his best. He gave you his only begotten son. How can we sit there and say, you know what, God? Um, I think I got $7.57 left over. That's not what we treat God. We show God love by giving our first. Amen. Our heart. He wants our heart. That's why when it comes to giving, it's not equal giving, but it's equal sacrifice. You make $5,000 a week. Praise God. Amen. If you do. Amen. Someone making $150 a week. But they give with a glad heart. They give with a glad heart. Go back to Cain and Abel. There's many people talk about one came from the earth, one came from uh, the field. And that's why he didn't accept. But it was his attitude. It was his attitude that caused God to curse him. Because even when God checked him, even when God checked him, he had the audacity to say, you know, he, he got mad. And that's what would happen. It's about your attitude. So your first fruit is really about an attitude adjustment. Give God your best up front. And then we talk about the Feast of Pentecost. But all of these feasts and festivals, they're celebrating the New Testament in different ways. Amen. You had the Feast of Trumpets. You had the Day of Atonement. You had all of these different things, but it was always about redemption and buying back and showing us and leading the path back to Christ and showing that he was the ultimate sacrifice. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a couple of these. Uh, amen. Hey, what's brother, uh, brother Randy? God bless you, man. Good to hear from you. Amen. And we talk about that and we talk about even the different things that that that, that point to Christ. Let's talk about uh, the ark that Noah built. Remember, man had sinned, right? Man had sinned. So he said, you know what? I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to destroy the earth because guess what? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin are death. And we're paying, when we're not in Christ, we're dying. Amen. We, we, we're dying. And, and, and the way to sin to death. So in order to get you back, I got to pay you back. I got to redeem you back. So the Ark of the Covenant, not the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark that Noah built, that was given instruction by God, by God, the, from the wood, from the height to the length, from the animals, even when it comes to the tabernacle. If you look at the tabernacle, it's so deep. It laid in, in, in the things of God, where it talks about some of the material on the outward, where it was made of gold, amen, a solid gold that represents royalty, and the inside it represented a wood, which talked about Christ's humanity. So everything in his instruction, that's why you tell your neighbor, touch your neighbor and say, follow God's instruction. Follow God's instruction, because God knows what he's doing. You imagine being Noah, and God tell you it's going to rain? Because it never rained before. I don't know if you knew that or not. It had never rained. It never rained before. Think about this. In the beginning, when Adam was in the garden, I'm telling you, there's nuggets. There's so many nuggets in the Bible. When Adam was in the garden, before he sinned, he did not have to work. He did not have to work. Part of his curse, when God told him, you're going to sweat by, you're going to, you're going to work and you're going to sweat on, on your brow. That's how hard you're going to work. That's why work seems so hard for us. Amen. That's why, oh God. Well, men are not in God. And I say they all like this. It's so hard for them to work because it's a curse. The water used to spring up from the ground with no effort. The water would just spring up and water the garden. He had to do nothing. Amen. But it had never rained before. It never rained because remember, when God created the rains, the waters of the sky, he told them to hold back. He lets the rain, he allows the rain to come forth. He, he tells the water that's in the ocean, in the rivers, you stay back. You stay back. And let me, let me share something with you. I don't know if you know this from a scientific perspective, but the same amount of water that was in the earth in the beginning is the same amount of water that's in the earth today. God has this amazing system called condensation, which he allows the rain to come down. Then he allows the rain to come back up in condensation and he fill up the clouds and it moves around. Yeah, you don't think God is real. God is real. So he told Noah it was going to rain, something they never did before. I need you to build this boat. And I'm telling you what God is telling you today. It's going to rain. And you know what rain represents? Judgment. It represents judgment because of sin. Now, the ark represents a place of safety. If you was not in the ark, you were not saved. And Jesus is the ark of safety. He's the one because judgment is going to come. Tell your neighbor, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Jesus is real, y'all. Amen. So we talk about, I'm going to give you a couple more. We're going to cut up. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to pick this up tomorrow. We're just going to move our other lesson the next week because I think there's too much for us to stop on this. Amen. And, and I'm going to give you more. Because uh, then that way y'all can do some homework and look up some types and shadows. Amen. Um, was Isaac. Remember, remember that he was the son that was not supposed to be born. He was not supposed to. Remember, Sarah was barren. 
Mary was a virgin. There's a, I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of symbolism. As a matter of fact, let me bring, let me, let me, let me read this to you. I tell you, I'm excited about the word. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm truly excited about what God is doing. Amen, amen. So, so when we talk about that, I know it was in my notes. Don't, don't mess with me. It was in my notes. I saw it in my notes. Amen. It's right here. It's right here. We talk about Isaac. He was the only son. He was the promised son. He was a promised son. And guess what? He was supposed to be given up for a sacrifice. Amen? He was supposed to be given up for a sacrifice. Then we talk about the Passover lamb. Then we talk about the brazen serpent that Moses had. And when he would lift up, he said, look to this and you shall live. That serpent represented, it was on a, on a stick. It was the same thing as the cross. Then there was something that was known as the scapegoat in the Old Testament. The same thing for Christ. Now, here's a comparison with Moses, with Jesus. In the Old Testament, Old Testament, um, they both was preserved in childhood. If you don't remember, if you don't remember um, that Moses' mother put him in a river to save him from Pharaoh's rule. And if you remember that Jesus, Mary and Joseph had to go to Egypt for a season. Amen. Because they were looking for him. Um, they had to confront evil. They both had to fast for 40 days. They both at one point had to control the sea. One said, raise it up. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, they both fed a multitude. Both of them uh, endured murmuring. Um, they were discrediting their hometown. Uh, they, had, they both had 70 workers. And this is found in Numbers 11, 16 and 17 for Moses. And for Jesus is Luke 10 and 1. Amen. I'm going to make this, some of this information available to you guys to let you know I did not make this up. When you study about the tabernacle, when you talk, so talk about these different things, it just really shows you that throughout the Old Testament that God had a plan. He had a magnificent plan. He had a magnificent plan. Even when it comes to numbers, and I don't want us to go crazy with numbers because sometimes we get spooky with stuff too. Amen. We overdo it. You over-spiritualize certain things. Something, somebody, I think it was uh, Sister Mietta said, just let May be May. I'm trying to make May uh, a miracle May. Just, it's May. Just let make it May. It, it, don't overdo it because sometimes we try to be so spiritual because we try to be impressive. But there are absolute numbers in the Bible that are symbolic of certain things. And the number 40 is a very significant number. Let me give it to you in three occasions. It's much, much more than that. When you talked about Moses, amen, he had three periods of 40. Three periods of 40. When he returned 40 was when he got kicked out <laughs> and had to go to the back of the desert. He spent 40 years there. Amen. And then he spent 40 years leading. Amen. Noah was in the ark. How many days? 40 days and 40 nights. When Jesus was tempted, how long did he fast? 40 days. The number 40 is the number of testing, of trial. That's what it symbolized. So there's a lot of other numbers that, that represents three, uh, represents um. Uh, I want to say completion is not really completion because seven is perfection and eight is a new beginning. Amen. So you see numbers, they're symbolic, but again, they're not to be used to be spooky. But if you look throughout the Bible, it'll help you understand a lot about what it is that God was doing. Amen. So my prayer today, my prayer today is that you realize that God had a plan to redeem you, that his price that he paid was his son that he gave. Even we we look at Ruth and Naomi, we look about that and how when uh, Boaz had to buy her back, Amen. This is constantly throughout the Old Testament. We talk about Joseph throughout the Old Testament. Almost every person was a symbol of who Christ was. They were not the totality, but they were symbolic. Different events that took place when God provided. That's why He had the names Jehovah this and Jehovah that. But in all of those things, God is here to get only have one name. These was things that was reminders and symbols and types to show what was the coming. But Jesus is the answer to all of this. When he said, I am that I am, he was saying, I am Jesus. That's who I am. I'm everything wrapped up in one. So my prayer today, amen, amen, is that you understand that there's more to it than just jumping and shouting. God had a plan for your life. He had you on his mind. Amen. When you were wherever you were, wherever I was, God had a plan on our mind. Amen. On his mind. Amen. To redeem us back to him. God paid a price. He sent his only begotten son. And it's up to us to accept that. And, and, and make no mistake about it. This is just not a man or a woman standing in a pulpit, screaming and shouting, telling you, you must be saved. God been telling us for a long time. And what happened, let me say this to you. When you talk about the Jewish people and the people of Islam, 
A lot of them believe in the Old Testament. They do not believe that Jesus was the answer. But it's almost like me telling you that there's a man going to knock on your door at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He's going to come in a red truck. He's going to be wearing a blue shirt and green pants with white sneakers on. And I'm telling you this. And I've been telling you this. And I'm telling you he's going to speak in a certain language. And when he shows up, because he's not what you think he should look like, even though I gave you all these things, you reject them. And that's what happened. Because, see, they thought Jesus was coming as the king. He wasn't coming as the king because this is not, this is not his kingdom. <laughs> this is not his kingdom. He was coming to redeem us back. He was coming to empower us as ambassadors here in the earth realm. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is who we are and that is what we represent here in the earth realm. Amen. So he come to redeem us back and we are to work while it's yet till day. Amen. We're going to continue on this lesson on tomorrow because I want to give you some more nuggets, some more examples of, of this, this wonderful, wonderful uh, lesson of redemption because it's the whole Bible is nothing about re but redemption. Amen. Again, please don't forget, please don't forget that today at 12 o'clock, we have our noonday prayer. If uh, one of our scribes would put that information in there with our lady, Pamela Odom, she would be leading that. Um, it starts at 12 o'clock sharp, and she usually finishes about 12, 30, a little bit after that. She usually give a lesson, uh, give some words of sharing, then she go into praying. Uh, we ask that you please join us for that. And tonight at seven o'clock, we're gonna ask you to join us for our Bible study where we'll be soaping Sunday's lesson where we talked about uh, the root of bitterness, amen. And I pray that you have been really looking into that. And those who don't know what SOAP is, is scripture observation, application and prayer, where we go back and we look at the lesson because I want you to get the lesson, but it gotta make sense to you. It's not about the entertaining. It's not about me just impressing you, but it's about taking the word of God and applying it to your life because the only way you're gonna grow, amen, you gotta eat the whole roll. You can't nibble at it and pick on the parts that you want but you have to really, really get it. And one thing I love about, even this situation, I must say love it, is that it's forcing us to get beyond the shout. Amen, I could, I could have a ham and organ play in the background, you can shout in your living room, your dining room, but it's really not about that. It's about your spiritual growth and the things of God. So that's why we're bringing you this manner, morning manner, so that you could take this and you could really meditate on it and it give you strength for the day. Amen. And by, and we're trying to, I think we're doing about five feedings a day. I think that's what we're doing about now. Uh, we have uh, three morning manners. We have our Bible class. We have our Sunday service. Plus we have our prayer. And there may be other occasions as well. So we're trying to make sure that we keep you guys godly fat. Because somebody said yesterday, we should not come out of this fat, just fatter, but we should come out of this further. That means we should not be where we were when we started, but we should be further along. Amen. And is that our prayer and a desire. Please keep those in mind. And join us this Sunday, if you can, at 10 a.m. We have a very special Mother's Day program. I have special guests that's going to join me Sunday. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be it's going to be cool. It's a Mother's Day special that we are presenting on this Sunday. So if you could join us for 10 a.m. on uh, Sunday morning, be with us. But don't forget, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we will continue in redemption. Amen. We continue in redemption because I feel like there's more. I don't want to rush us through. Yes, there's the call right there. Please make sure you join us at, at, at that time. Thank God for all of you, each and every one of you. We love you. We thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.